Good morning. It's so good to see you here today. Uh, we're in a series that we've just started called Next Is Now. I want to ask somebody something here today. Who moved to Jacksonville like in the last five years? Anybody out here, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Oh my, look around, look around. Five years. All right. How many was moved to Jacksonville? How many original Jacksonville people are here today in the house? Anybody original Jacksonville folks? Two people, two people. So a, a lot of us, you know, moving is a good example of a transition in life, isn't it? Uh, you you got to get, you got to pack up, you got to, got to declutter. You have to uh, get a new school system. You got to get a new doctor. Got to get a new dentist. You got to meet your new neighbors. Got to find out where the best grocery store and the best restaurants and where you're going to work out and uh, how everything works in this area. And so. Um, all of us have really been through some transitioning over the last couple of, of, of years, and, and life is full of tra- transitions, and you know, Roots Church, we're in a transition. We are transitioning for the last two years. We've been at Ponte Vedra High School and uh, been through a lot. God has been faithful, and we're moving, we're, we're transitioning to a permanent location on St. John's Parkway. And uh, in July 1st, and so there's a whole lot of shaking going on, a whole lot of changing things and packing up, and you know, kind of figuring out where it's gonna, stuff's gonna go, and 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 what you need to get rid of, and that kind of thing. But transitions are a part of life, and so in our series, next is now. We're talking about how to get through life's transitions, because it's just not about moving. We transition physically, we transition relationally in our relationships. We transition in our careers, don't we? Because doors open, opportunities can't come. Um, friends transition in and out of our life. Our health transitions, all kinds of things. Life is filled with transitions. And so we want to talk about how do we grow through transition and not get stuck in the middle of transition and spin our wheels and go backwards. And so we're looking at the book of Joshua. And Joshua is a book of transitions because it's like the children of Israel. They get to the doorstep of their brand new house and they open the U-Haul and they put out the ramp on the back of the U-Haul. They're getting ready to move in to their, to their new place. It's an exciting time. They've been homeless for about 40 years in, in, the, in the wilderness. And so we're talking about, how, you know, how did they do it and try to, try to figure out some, some lessons and, you know, we looked at last week, Joshua chapter 1. He's, he's the new leader because Moses was now dead. And Joshua's, Joshua's afraid. He's worried that he doesn't have what it takes. He's, he's uh, like, you know, Moses could do it. I mean, he could pray bread down from heaven and work miracles and part seas. How am I going to do this? And God says to Joshua, and we learned it last week, Joshua 1, Hey, be strong. Moses is dead. That season, Moses' season is gone. Don't be thinking about Moses. Moses is dead. You be strong and you be courageous. As I was with Moses, so will I be with you. And I think about that for myself. As as God was with my father, God was with my grandfathers, I know he's going to be with me, as God was with the previous generation working miracles, He's going to be working in your generation. Be strong and courageous. And He said, Don't meditate on what you don't have, meditate on the Word of God and His promises, and you will be very successful. Be strong and courageous. But Joshua was still kind of worried, and he needed a little more kind of encouragement that he was going to be, to be able to do that. And so uh, and, and, and he had good reason to be because the first city when they would cross into the land of promise was Jericho. And it was the most uh, fortified city in all of the promised land. And there have been archaeological digs around Jericho area and they found out these walls at Jericho were, were there, was, there were two walls. The one at the base of the hill was 13 feet tall. And then up further on the hill, there was another wall that was also 13 feet tall. And then on top of this hill was the city, the four-acre city of Jericho. So standing at the hill, looking up these massive walls, I mean, it looked like no one could take Jericho. It looked impossible. And so Joshua needs just a little bit more confirmation. He sends some spies out. 
to say, hey, I need you to check it out for me. And he meets an interesting, these spies meet an interesting person. Her name's Rahab. And I want to talk with you about Rahab today because she was in transition. She was in Jericho, and we know Rahab as Rahab the harlot. Rahab the harlot, and God would use her in an incredible way. And her story is found in Joshua chapter 2, and as Scripture looks at her life, in, in that one chapter, we're going to see how we can have faith for the next season. And that's what I want to talk with you about, having faith for the next season today. Here, look at it, Joshua 2, verse 1. This is kind of surprising. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go, look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. Got to check that place out. So they went, these spies went, and they entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab, and they stayed there. So here's the first thing, faith in the middle of your transition for the new season. God works through unlikely people who see what's next with the eyes of faith. They see what's next with, with spiritual eyes of faith. And many scholars have tried to clean up Rahab's uh, reputation. And they've said that Rahab was a hostess, or she was like a maitre d' or an innkeeper, or a receptionist, but the Hebrew word here used is zona, and it means literally a prostitute. And so let's remember that Rahab was not living in the Bible Belt. She wasn't living in, in, out in Texas or Oklahoma somewhere. She was living in the middle of Sin City where there were no churches. But, but she heard about the God of Israel and what the God of Israel had done to Pharaoh and how he had delivered his people from Egypt and part of the seas and how they had won so many battles in the wilderness. And Rahab, though she was kind of working in this shady occupation, faith began to build inside of her heart. She wanted to serve this, this God, the God of the Israelites. And she had the faith to open that door and let those two Israelite spies into her house, knowing that they were from Israel and facing, putting herself in great danger. What's so interesting about Rahab is her faith is celebrated three times in the New Testament. I want to give you the first one here. Look at Hebrews eleven thirty one. If you don't know this, this is the great hall of fame faith chapter in the Bible, the faith hall of fame. Here it is. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. By faith, she welcomed those spies into her house. Now, maybe you're asking like me, what were the spies? Why were they knocking on a prostitute's door? And, and what were they doing with, with Rahab? Well, her house was part of the city wall, the Bible tells us, and it would have been a great place to escape should anybody find out where they were. They would be able to escape through a window. And also it was the perfect place to hide because people were coming and going and no one would think anything of two strange people in a place and a setting like that. And all I want to say to you today is it's remarkable who God uses today. I, I want you to hear that today. It's remarkable the people that we see in the Word of God that God uses. And maybe you're here today and you feel like, you know what, I'm an unlikely candidate because my past is, is still in my present and, and I come from a broken family. I come from a broken marriage. In fact, I come from maybe a few broken marriages. I think there was a, some ladies like and some men like that in the, in the Bible. And you have this story and it follows you around and you doubt if God would ever use somebody like you. And you need to know today that God is not looking at any of those things. What attracts the attention of God and gets a, him involved in our life, working in our life, is our faith. And when he sees faith, regardless of where you've been or what you've done, it, 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 God says, oh my goodness, look at that. I can work with that. Hebrews eleven six it says this, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and then he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And so I want to, you know, what is faith? We're talking about faith. Faith is simply this. Faith is not seeing what is right now. Faith is seeing what can be by God's grace. 
So it's so many, it's, it's so easy to see the way things are maybe in your marriage right now. I was telling the dream team earlier this morning, it's like the farmer who goes out and he's got grass and ponds and trees and there's bass in the pond and there's animals, but all he sees are the cow patties. And he can't enjoy the beautiful farm that he's living on because all he smells and sees and counts are cow patties. And it can be that way in our life. All we focus on are the cow patties that we all have in our life. But we need to lift our eyes up and by faith not see what is, but see what can be by God's grace. And Rahab, she she could see already what was going down because faith was working in her heart. What is faith like? Here's the next thing. Action is the natural byproduct of faith. Action is the natural byproduct of faith. The king of Jericho, he would hear that there were spies in his city, and he would send out men to knock on Rahab's door. And when they knocked on her door, they said, hey, we heard somebody the word got out. You have spies that are spying out this city. We want you to bring those men out. And what would she do? She was in a difficult spot. The Bible says here in Joshua 2, 4 through 5, look at this. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me, and I did not know where they had come from. And at dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. Man, Rahab's quick on her feet. She's a woman. In fact, Rahab is the first heroine in, the old, in all the Bible. The first hero. Faith hero in all the Bible. She's a woman of action. A woman of courage. And in a split second, she decides to hide these spies. We've got to hide. The Bible tells us she takes them and she goes up to the roof and she puts them under stalks of flax. Say, hey, you guys out here. She goes and she opens the door. She's like, what spies? I, uh, oh, yeah, they were, I didn't know they were spies, but they left, and they went around this way, and if you guys hurry up and go that way, you, you, might, you might catch them. Then Rahab, she would talk to these spies, and she was like, she was very quick to say, hey, would you please protect my family? And then they said, we will, but you need to take a scarlet cord and hang it from your window. If you'll do that, your family will be safe. And Rahab said, okay, that's not a problem. She went out and she hung that scarlet cord from her window. Then she let those spies down the, the, the window so that they could escape when the time was right. And she gave them this timely advice, very wise advice. In verse 16 of Joshua 2, she said to them, Go to the hills so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourself there three days until they return and then go on your way. Timely advice. Now here's here's another amazing reference to Rahab's faith in the New Testament. James 2, 24 through 25, it says, You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. And, And we're big on being saved by grace through faith alone, but the other side of faith is obedience. The other side of faith is actions, and a living faith produces results. It just comes naturally. In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous. Why? For what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. And so more than a song, more than words, more than a t-shirt, more than a bumper sticker, more than a feeling, faith looks like action. It's like action. There was a famous stunt guy back in the day. His name was Blondine. He was like the evil Knievel of his generation. And he's, he made this big publicity stunt and wanted to get as much attention as possible. And he said, I'm going to tightrope across Niagara Falls. And a large crowd gathered there. And it was stretched like 1,100 feet across this one particular part of the falls and that, that cable that he was walking across was only two inches wide. And the people on the other side that he was walking toward began to chant, Blondine, we believe, Blondine, we believe, we believe, Blondine. And he got all the way across. They were cheering, we believe, we believe. And he said, you know what, I'm going back. 
a cross with a wheelbarrow. I was like, yes, we believe, we believe, Blondie. He said, I'm looking for a volunteer. Who will get in the wheelbarrow? And I'll push him across, back across Niagara Falls. And you could have heard a pin drop. No one wanted to get in that wheelbarrow. Church, I want us to remember today and, and think about what just happened. Like, we got in the wheelbarrow. First of all, we, 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 you know, we launched a church in 2020. And then we began to pray. We began to ask God, God, would you give us a location? Would you give us a space? Would you give us a home? We began to knock on doors, and we were praying about this. If you've been at Roots Church, we've been asking you to pray, and we would be knocking on doors, and no, we don't want a church here. We don't want a church here. We don't want a church here. And finally, in a brand new building in Durban, the, the owner said, yeah, we'll, we'll put a, we'll, we, you can put a church here. And then we began to think, you know, all we had raised was $200,000, and the build-out was going to cost a lot more than that. But we stepped out into that wheelbarrow, and we signed that lease. And we began, we've all been praying, God, would you provide, would you provide, would you make a way? And we said, hey, let's, let's pray for a loan. Let's pray that maybe a bank will give us favor. And all the banks were like, no way, Jose, no way, Jose. We don't want to talk to a church that's two years old. Uh, hasta la vista, don't let the door hit you when you walk out or anything like that. But I want you to know, last week we heard we got approved for a $500,000 loan. That's right, $500,000 loan, deferred payments for 12 months, interest rate is 2.75 through the SBA. Amen? That's incredible. And it was uh, one of these nonprofit loans. And it seemed like it wasn't going to happen, but at the last minute, God made a way where there is no way. And so we're moving in. We are moving in. It's going to happen. We're going to open the doors to everything in that room being brand new, ready to love on people and tell them about the love of Jesus. Action is a part of our faith. God said, I'm, I'm, if you're going to, we're going to work together. Faith is important. Got to have faith. It's impossible to do what I've called you to do without faith. It's the extension cord that gets us plugged into the socket, that gets his grace beginning to flow in our lives. So faith looks like action. And here's the, the third thing. We talk about faith for transition seasons. It's, it's simply this. Faith comes by hearing. To these worried spies, man, they were looking at Jericho. and They're like, I don't know how these ex-slaves from Egypt are ever going to take this incredible city. Rahab, the prostitute, begins to preach these spies a sermon. It's amazing. And she begins to build their faith. And I want you to look at what she says. This is Joshua 2, verses 9 through 11. This is kind of the, this is Rahab's sermon. Says, Y'all go to church. Let me preach you a little bit. And, and I want you to notice what she says in Joshua 2, 9 through 11. I know, she says that the Lord has given you this land. You can just see that, I don't know what we're going to do. This is, this is big walls. He says, I know. Roots, I know the Lord has given us that space. Amen? She says, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us. So that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. And I can just see the spies going, really? Are you, are you serious? Well, that's good news because we thought it was the complete opposite. Wait till Joshua hears about this. Everybody's melting in fear. we got to tell him. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to Sihon and Og. The two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan who you completely destroyed. This is the third time she says this. When we what? Heard of it. Our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed. Look at this statement. Because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Hey spies, I just want you to remember who your God is. He is the God of heaven and earth. All the cattle, all the, everything in all of creation belongs to him, heaven and earth. And twice she says here, we know, we've heard, and we know, and we've heard, we've heard. God is God of heaven and earth. So where does faith come from? Faith comes from hearing, the Bible says. 
you want to build your faith, you need to ask yourself, what are you hearing? Do you ever have selective hearing? You ever wonder if your husband has selective hearing? It's only, he only hears, ah! And I wonder sometimes if we have selective hearing where we just hear bad stuff. Hearing is so important. Paul writes in Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I just want to say today that what you're hearing will either poison your faith or position your faith and get you ready for the next season. That's how important what you're hearing is. And there are so many reports today in our world, let's be for real, about scandals, exposés, who did this, can't believe so-and-so fell. And look at all this, look at all their dirty laundry. And we get into the podcasts, we get into the YouTube investigation reports, and there's something inside of us, we want to peel the onion and get as deep into the reasons and all the dirty, nitty-gritty of what so-and-so did, especially when it comes to a pastoral failure. We'll pull back that onion and get to the very core. You know what? You'll never really get what you're looking for. And is that what you are hearing today? Is that what you're listening? And I just want to say to us today that for every pastor that's fallen, there are thousands of pastors who are faithful to God. Thousands and thousands, multiple thousands who love their wives, love their families, love the church, love the Word of God, and who are faithful to the call of God on their life. And so we need to remember this. God said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And Roots Church, I want to ask you today, whose report are you hearing today? Because if you're hearing the other report, your faith is not going to be positioned well to lead you into the new season that God wants to lead you into. And so you have to say to yourself, I know that the bad report's out there, but I'm going to listen to the good report. I'm going to listen to what God's doing and build my faith. Here's the next thing about faith. Faith in transition always makes an impact on others. I just want to say this today. Rahab said, I, I want you to save my family. Just don't save me. It's my brothers and my sisters and my father and my mother. Please, please save my family. Now what they, what they had to do is get into her house on the day when the Israelites would march around the wall. And I can just see her tying that red cord and hanging it out the window, flapping loud and proud for everybody to see. And her family saying, you know what, Rahab's serious. Look at her faith. She, she believes something. Something deep down inside of her. We see that. We want to be a part of that. Her family got into the house and their lives were saved. Someone said faith is more caught than it is taught. It's more caught than taught. And when our loved ones see it lived out in the sermon of our lives. Everybody here is preaching a sermon. When they see faith lived out in the transition seasons, not only of our lives, but of our churches and of our communities and in our families, be it through sickness or, 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 or trials or whatever comes. When they say, see that faith show up, man, it makes a difference. And they say, I, I, I don't know yet, but I'm following that because I see it lived out. And not only did her faith have an impact on her family, it had an impact on Joshua. Remember, we were talking about Joshua because Joshua was like, I still don't know if I got it. Well, the spies, they heard Rahab's word and the spies go back and this is what they tell timid Joshua to get him ready. Look, Joshua 2, verse 24, they said to Joshua, the Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. Joshua said, okay, you met a prostitute who was a believer in the walls of Jericho who hid you and she told you this? I know we can do it. And here's the thing, the faith of one person 
influence an entire people to get them ready to go into the promised land. It is true, fear spreads like a virus. Complaining and murmuring spread like the flu. But I want to say the faith of one person spreads the same way. All it takes is one who says, I believe. I know. I know that the Lord is with us. So faith in transition always makes an impact on others. And here's the last thing I want to share with you today from the story of Rahab. Faith connects us to grace and a new story. I grew up in a pastor's home. My dad was a church planter. Both my grandfathers were church planters. And we lived in a kind of a Pentecostal, charismatic preacher's house. And we would have all-night prayer meetings at church probably a couple times a year. I remember as a kid being taken to an all-night prayer meeting. And I tried to pray. And all I know is I, I crawled under the seat to to just kind of maybe play with some things. And the next thing I knew, I woke up and there was slobber all over my face and it was the morning time. And uh, our whole life revolved around, around church. And one time my dad even bought a tent and he set up a tent on some land. And in the summer, he said, we're having a revival and it's going to be called 21 Days of Blaze. 21 Days of Row Church. This was in the, the 90s. And in the middle of the summer, literally, it was 21 days of torture, 21 days of blazing heat under a sun with, with, with sawdust. And, but I look back, and I so much appreciate my parents' faith. They didn't have a pattern. They didn't have a blueprint. So we're gonna, we're gonna blood, our, our kids are going to love Jesus. It might look like 21 days of blaze, but we're going we're gonna to try to figure this thing, this thing out. But I'm so thankful for them, but... In my tradition, I did not hear much about grace. I didn't ever hear a sermon about Rahab growing up. And now that I look at it, I see the Bible full of stories about Rahab's. That we remember that there was a Samaritan woman by the well that Jesus spoke with. And she had five husbands. And the one that she was living with was not her husband. And Jesus used her to change her life. And she was a messenger, an evangelist. And then there was Mary Magdalene who had demons, seven demons that Jesus cast out and she was bound up in her life. And uh, there was the woman even called in the act of adultery who Jesus rescued her life and he said to her, woman, where are your accusers? Go and sin no more. And Rahab's in a, in a list of those names, of those people in the Bible. And I love this. This is the... The story about Rahab that I love the most, Joshua 2, 21, it says, So she sent them away, and they departed, and look at this, and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. I like that. Flapping. No one else in Jericho was tying scarlet cords to their windows. She tied that scarlet cord to the window, and she hung it out loud and proud and her family sheltered behind that scarlet cord. Their lives were saved from death. And it makes us think about, we don't have a scarlet cord, but we have the blood of Jesus, don't we? The blood of Jesus that he shed for us on the cross. And it seems kind of ridiculous sometimes if you think about it. Crucified Savior, I'm going to identify with that. And scripture says yes. If you'll take your confidence away from other things in yourself and put it in the Savior and His shed blood for you and you apply that to your life. Your sins are forgiven. You're saved from death. You have a home in heaven. And not only that, you have a brand new beginning. Like Rahab. A fresh start. And here's, so, here's the thing about Rahab. Her life was saved. Her family's life was saved. But she was brought into that family of Israel. She was engrafted into the family and her old story, her old life was washed away. She was given a new future and the Bible tells us that she was married. And we find her name, the third reference in the New Testament is in the most prestigious 
genealogy in all of the Bible, if you know anything about genealogies in Scripture, they're more like statements, and people were very proud about their family heritage. And this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, and Rahab's name is found there. And it's in Matthew 1, 5 through 6. It says this, Salmon, the father of Boaz, this would have been a surprising thing, whose mother was Rahab, the prostitute. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. God blessed her and gave her a husband. Her name was, the Bible says, Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz, who was the father of Obed, who was the father of Jesse, who was the father of King David. And so Rahab ended up being the great, great grandmother of, of Israel's greatest king, King David. And from King David would come, we sang about it, the, the, the root of David. Remember that song we were singing about the root of David, the tribe of David? From David's tribe would come Jesus the Messiah. And David's great-great-grandmother was a prostitute whose life was changed. And here's the message From brokenness, emptiness, loneliness, despair, and sin came grace, hope, salvation, mercy, and blessing, not just to Rahab, but to the whole world. And it all started with faith in a time of transition. It all started when two spies knocked on her door. She had heard about the God of Israel and these two spies from Israel knocked on her door and she had the courage to say, come in, I'll hide you. And generations were blessed. It's amazing the life transforming power that's unleashed in our lives when we put our faith in Jesus the Savior today. It connects us with grace. Connects us to a new story. It connects us to a new beginning and it helps us to see what's next because where where you've been is not where you're going. God is taking you somewhere way better. So let's begin to see with the eyes of faith and believe that our God is working for us today. Can we bow our heads? Everybody, let's bow our heads together today. If you're watching online and and you're here today, and you've, you've never made that faith commitment and you're just saying, you know, today, that's me. I want to put my faith and confidence in Jesus the Savior. I want to, like Rahab invited those spies in, I, I want to open my house. I want to open my heart to Jesus the Savior and invite him into my life to be my Lord and Savior. I want to lead you in a prayer. If that's you here today, pray this prayer with me. Jesus, I come to you today. Come into the home of my heart. Forgive me. Create in me a clean heart. Thank you for a new story today. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for grace. Thank you that what I was doesn't define me today. Thank you for a new beginning and eternal life. I put my faith in you. I believe you died, rose again. Live in my heart today. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, we would love to know about it. Wendy and I, we're going to be out in the lobby area today. We'd love to meet you. Um, and we, we also, we want to invite you as we get ready, we're calling it Roots 2.0. And I just want to tell you this, this is kind of weird for a pastor to say, I just want to be a little weird. We do not expect explosive growth over the next couple of months while we're in transition. But we're, we're still inviting and we're still loving people. And um, 
we're getting ready for the new season that God has for us on St. John's Parkway. And so every Sunday is really important to love the people that God brings, but we're also going to be just sharing vision about where we're headed. And so we want to invite you. There is a place for you in Roots 2.0. We want to ask everybody here to be a part of the team because we need a lot of loving, smiling faces to love on people. It's not about the building. It's about the people in the building. Amen? It's about the people in the building. And I I was just sharing. Uh, that's great. Nelsie said, I'm ready. All right. So I was talking to a guy over at lacrosse game the other day, yesterday. It was, it was yesterday. And I, I said, hey, you know, we're opening a location here in July. And he said, really? I said, you should come to church with your son. He says, I haven't been to church since I was a kid. I went to a real strict Catholic church where they were just on my case all the time. I'd do it just right this way, and then I never came back. I love for my son to be a part of a church because he's nine. I said, well, your son would love it because we have fun at church. We actually smile, and they jump up and down and, and, and have a good time and learn that Jesus loves them and God has a purpose for their life. Your son would love it. Okay, okay, I'll come. I'll come. And there are so many like that. And so uh, let's begin to think not about what was, but let's begin to see with the eyes of faith about what God's going to do. Amen? Amen. So we want to just invite you again, May 15th at 4 p.m., open house and a time of prayer over at the new, the new location. So let's stand together today. I want to pray a blessing over your life, that God would bless you as we leave this place today, and that his mercy and grace would go before you. Lord, we just thank you for this day. We pray, God, that we would go out with faith in our hearts, knowing that you're working for our good. The past is behind us, and you're opening a brand new future for us, and we want to step into it boldly. God, as we leave today, we leave with your blessing, we leave with your spirit, and we leave with your love. In Jesus' name, amen.